Hello, hello, thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. It's uh, so awesome to be here. This is my first signal. Um, really nice to see you all. Thanks for coming by. Thanks for uh, wrapping up your lunch early to come talk about or hear me talk about useless hacking. Uh, so I like making stuff, uh, but to be more specific, I like making useless stuff. Uh, so when it comes to electronics and coding, the projects I find the most rewarding are those that don't seem to have a practical application or real commercial viability. So uh, today what I'd like to talk about is some of the projects I've undertaken, and I want to propose that these so-called useless hacks um, actually do serve a meaningful purpose, and I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, what is that purpose? We're gonna talk about that today. So um, pulling from the unlikely arenas of art history and fashion, uh, what I'd like to do is kind of propose a framework for understanding the value of useless electronic hacking. Um, and I'm kind of gonna do that with some examples from my own work. Uh, and my hope is that this framework or this way of thinking about useless hacks can be a tool that you can actually walk away with today um, to apply and help you better understand what you make, uh, why you're making it, and what it all means. Sound good? And can you guys hear me okay? I know we've got the, the ghosts uh, haunting the tent. Everyone in the back, volume's good? Okay, great. So uh, first, let me tell you a little bit about myself so you can know where I'm coming from. Really quickly, uh, why did Signal give me the microphone today? Uh, this is me uh, with a beautiful Sharp Twin Famicom. Uh, my name is Rachel Weil, you can call me Ray. Uh, I live in Austin, Texas, and um, as was mentioned in the intro, uh, I write code at Microsoft as a developer evangelist, uh, mostly for open source technologies um, like Node.js, uh, but I do a couple other things as well. Uh, I help run Wagos Rancheros, which is Austin's uh, indie games collective. So we run a lot of events in Austin, like uh, Fantastic Arcade, which is a yearly conference, um, I also head up our artist residency program called Arcade of Anything. We actually give money to artists to create experimental, non-commercial games. Uh, in addition, in 2012, I founded Femicom Museum, uh, which is basically a, um, an archive cataloging femininity and cute culture and girlhood in 20th century games. So it's a piece of video game and computing history that's mostly been ignored by historians. So uh, I have hundreds and hundreds of like Barbie CD-ROM games uh, that I actually document and historicize. Um, and then finally, I write new software for old hardware. Um, so as you can see, I'm really into games and really into old stuff. Um, writing new software for old hardware and other ways of combining kind of computing history with contemporary technology is really interesting to me. Um, it's, I think it's just fun to reclaim old hardware and make it do something that it wasn't intended to do. Um, but one thing about this is that this hobby is kind of set up to presuppose a bit of uselessness, right? So the very act of designing something for obsolete hardware um, kind of has uselessness built into it because we know how rapidly um, hardware and technology becomes obsolete. So uh, really quickly, I'm gonna give you a, uh, a whirlwind tour of some of the projects I'm talking about that combine these sort of old and new technologies to make something new and maybe kind of useless. Uh, so this is a cactus gardening simulator for the Atari 2600. Uh, this is Find My Friends for Robots. Uh, so it's a, uh, it's a robot motion tracking web dashboard called RoboWriter. Uh, to help you see where your robot is going and also where your friend's robots are going ostensibly. Um, this was inspired by, of course, Logo Writer for DOS. Um, and it's using like an IoT hub to sort of manage all these different devices. Um, I know this might be hard to believe, but this is actually a fortune telling app. Um, <laughs> So it offers divination by having you, uh, you know uh, the toy, a barrel of monkeys? So you shake this virtual barrel of monkeys and you toss the monkeys onto a uh, holographic prismatic pentagram made out of wingdings fonts. <laughs> and then where the monkeys fall actually determines your fate. Uh, so credit to Natalie Lahed who um, did the amazing rotoscoping and also most of the game development on this. Um, She's totally awesome. Uh, here's a fake operating system I designed. 
uh, for a imaginary computer called the Quick 128. Uh, I made a bot that tweets false video game facts, like this one. Uh, it says, happy birthday, Princess Peach turns 75 today. Hashtag gamers unite, uh, which got retweeted by bot other bots, so it's pretty funny. Um, this is a web application that uses a very sophisticated facial recognition API uh, to make memes automatically. Um, we'll just watch it again. Yeah, it's good. Uh, this is a 90s era landline phone that's been hacked to send text messages. Uh, and then finally, this is a working open source Wi-Fi modem and Twitter client for the NES. Yeah. So uh, those are some things I did over the past year or two. Uh, those are things, they exist. Um, I know it was a bit of a whirlwind, but I kind of wanted to give you a sense of the things that I'm interested in and, and sort of start thinking about their utility, which may not be apparent right away. Uh, I want to talk about a couple, like maybe the last three projects that I showed. I want to go a little bit more in depth on those and talk about some of the technologies underlying them. And I'll talk really briefly about um, the first two here. So the deal with it bot is actually pretty straightforward. Um, this is using uh, Microsoft Cognitive Services, which are basically pre-trained machine learning models um, that you call like a REST API. So um, that's pretty cool because you basically have access to over 20 machine learning algorithms like OCR, computer vision, or whatever, that are already trained. And because they're REST APIs, they're cross-platform, and they work in any language where you know how to make a REST call. Um, so that's pretty cool. So one of these is Face API. You send it a photo, it returns back this gigantic JSON object for every face that it's, is detected in the photo. And it gives you all these facial recognition points. So you've probably seen that if you've done any uh, work with facial recognition before. So inner eye, upper eye, upper lip, center point, all of that. Um, and so if you use all of this data, plus a little bit of math and a little bit of jQuery, you can actually figure out the perfect place to put glasses on someone. Um, and this is actually built in, um, so the glasses that come down, that's actually a div um, that's just animated with CSS uh, to sit on top of a photo that the user provides. So that's pretty cool because I actually don't do any image processing. I don't store any images. I don't have to like, do any uh, computation on my end. Everything is client side. Uh, so this is a radical landline phone that got hacked to send text messages. Uh, so this project actually has a slightly practical use. Um, it's definitely not like market ready, uh, but it's more useful than you might guess. Uh, so this is a gift shop called The Mall, and it's um, outside of a local art space in Austin called the Museum of Human Achievement. Um, and so the mall has this very like retro Saved by the Bell look. Um, it's really beautiful inside. Um, but you can see that there aren't tons of people around. It doesn't get a lot of foot traffic because um, it's, it's not in a very highly populated space. So the gallery wanted a way to accommodate a, occasional visitors to the gift shop without having to staff this trailer all the time. So uh, my friend Zach, who runs the museum, said, hey, is there a way that you could retrofit like a help phone so if people need to get in the trailer, uh, we could send somebody out there to unlock it. Because we don't want to ha have someone sitting out there, especially in Texas, all day, with maybe one person coming in per day, or, or maybe sometimes no people coming in. Uh, and so of course I thought immediately of using Twilio and the Raspberry Pi to make this happen. Uh, so aside from a few import statements that are kind of at the top of this, this is actually pretty much the entirety of the code that makes this work. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing because this is Signal, this might be kind of familiar to you, but this basically is using the Twilio um, REST client uh, for Python. Um, this is a Python script that basically runs when the Raspberry Pi boots up. Um, what it's doing is it's listening for a signal on two pins. One of those is connected to the handset hook. So I don't know if everyone in this room has used a landline phone before, but there's a hook in the, um, in the base of it. And when you take that phone off the hook, um, there's a little lever that kind of opens and closes a circuit. So it's basically looking to see if the phone has been taken off the hook. If it has, an audio message plays. Hello, welcome to the mall. If you'd like to enter, press any button now. Otherwise, hang up and walk away. I mean, that's what I wanted to say. I don't know if they're gonna stay with that, but um, that's kind of the idea. So if the person uh, wants to go in the shop, they can hit a button on the keypad, and now, um, 
through Twilio, actually everybody inside the museum, all the staff, will get a message and someone can come out, unlock the trailer and let them in. Uh, so finally, I want to talk a little bit more about maybe that unusual project at the end, which was um, connectedness. So um, this is, again, a, sort of a Wi-Fi modem and Twitter client for the NES. Um, I'm really into crafting and knitting and yarn work and things like that, so um, I just wanted to give a whole slide to this beautiful enclosure that I hand-stitched. Um, <laughs> I really wanted it to have a sort of like, a, kind of a mix between a, uh, the look of a modem and the look of a tissue box cozy that your grandmother might make. Uh, and I think this kind of captures it nicely. Uh, so what is connectedness? It's open source hack that allows you to wirelessly stream data to the original 8-bit NES game console. Um, and it does that without modifying the console in any way. So you can take any NES um, off the shelf or out of a garbage can or wherever you find NESs nowadays, um, plug this modem in, and you can actually grab internet data from it. In fact, the modem is something you can build yourself. Everything is um, on GitHub, uh, as well as like photos documenting how to wire everything up. Uh, so the three main components of connectedness are a custom cloud-hosted server backend, uh, a wireless modem, and okay, it's, it's not really a modem, you guys, but I like to call it a modem, uh, and finally, an NES game cartridge with a custom ROM. So I'm gonna go in a little bit more depth about technically what each of those does. Um, so the backend, is actually a node app, so it's written entirely in JavaScript. This is the most powerful piece, like computing-wise, this is the most powerful part of the whole system. So I try to do as much as possible in this app. Um, it's essentially grabbing, using the Twitter API to grab the latest tweet about uh, connectedness, so it's listening on a hashtag, um, and it's pulling that from Twitter's streaming API um, into the node app. It's gonna take that tweet and actually parse the string. So for those of you that do JavaScript uh, for the web, you, um, the idea of like taking a, a string, like a tweet, and chopping it into lines uh, sounds like a horrible idea, right? So we want responsive web, we want like text that grows and shrinks, as your website does. Um, but actually for the NES, we don't want that because the NES is not responsive. It actually only has one resolution. It's 256 pixels across. Um, and the NES is not that smart. It doesn't know what a string is. It doesn't know what words are. It doesn't know how to parse strings. So we wanna like basically pre-chew all the food that we can uh, in order to feed it to the NES. So we actually, um, I take that tweet, I figure out how many words can fit on a line, I chop it up all nice, um, so that all the NES has to do is display it, and even that's a stretch. Um, so once we have this tweet, I, I also do a couple other things. I strip out emojis. Um, so we're really limited on RAM and the number of characters we have. We cannot do full Unicode. We've got, you know, basically we can do uppercase, lowercase, and a couple special characters. That's what we have room for in the NES. So we strip out a couple things. Um, I don't worry about images, trying to render those on the NES, maybe version two. Um, so I take this tweet and publish that to the cloud. And the hardware inside is a particle photon, so it's actually uh, really similar to the hardware that we have in the badges. For those of you that have been checking out, that's a uh, particle electron. Uh, the one that I use is particle photon, which is similar, but uh, uses Wi-Fi, not GSM. And um, one really cool thing about working with the particle photon is they have this great JavaScript API that handles event messaging. So in this case, once I have my tweet that I'm ready to send to that device, um, I just use their JavaScript API and say, hey, I'm sending it over to my device. It handles things like authentication, um, knowing which device I want to send it to. So it's really awesome. I don't have to worry about that. It kind of uh, handles all of that for me. So here's the device. This is a particle photon. Um, and you'll see that it's wired up. Um, it is Arduino-like for those of you that haven't worked with it before. Um, I really love this microcontroller. Um, what this is doing is actually uh, listening for that event to come across from the Node app. Um, it's taking that string and converting it to an array of bytes, and then those bytes are being sent to the NES. And you might think, how do those bytes get in there? And the answer is a uh, very clever, genius thing that I totally did not think of, um, sending it through the controller port. So if you think about it, a controller is just, it's got eight buttons, it's sending bytes. And so it's basically this idea of hijacking that protocol and instead of sending button presses, we're actually sending bytes that correspond to letters, which is pretty cool. 
Um, so I always like, people ask me like, well, what happens if you just plug in a regular controller and mash the buttons? You'll actually get a garbage tweet of just random letters because the NES does not know the difference between a controller being pressed very carefully and me actually sending a very specific message through that same protocol. Um, so we've talked about the node server, we've talked about the, uh, the sort of hardware, and then the last piece of this is actually um, the NES cartridge, right? So NES doesn't have anything like fancy, like built-in ASCII. You can't do like a print line because it doesn't have any built-in text. Um, so all the letters and graphics and colors and everything are actually hand-drawn. Um, so at this point, it's just taking those bytes, um, pulling the corresponding letter out of uh, the cartridge memory and just, just writing it to the screen. Um, so if anyone has never written 6502 assembly, here's some. Uh, so this is possibly the only Twitter client that was written entirely in assembly, which is kind of cool. Um, so the project in whole is JavaScript C and in assembly. Um, this, What's shown here is a part of the code that resets the balloon X and Y coordinates as they're floating. So you can see um, it's pretty lengthy um, and pretty, pretty, pretty much on the low level side. Uh, cool, so those are some weird things I built. Yay! Um, <laughs> so when I look back on the past few years of projects like this, um, you know, I think this is cool. Um, I got some really flattering press about connectedness, um, read Twitter on a hacked Nintendo because your childhood needs to be ruined. That was cute. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, on the other hand, my technical resume looks like this now, uh, right? And so I kind of worry about this, right? Like, sometimes I have a hard time explaining to others what, it is, what I'm spending my time doing and why this stuff is interesting to me. And sometimes I'm not really sure either. Um, you know, why can't I just stick to making regular software that people would like pay money for? Um, and sometimes I feel guilty about making sort of irreverent stuff. Uh, it's interesting that we have a lot of ways to talk about experimental or non-commercially viable art forms, and none of these feel like they really apply as readily to software. Um, I don't know, I don't know what the adjective is there, right? And this line of questioning inevitably leads here which is, um, is software art. Also, alternative forms are, can software be art? Are games art, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I, I don't wanna answer this question today because I have like a finite amount of time on the stage, um, but I do wanna kind of point something out here. So when we look at this list again, music, film, art, cuisine, these are endeavors that can be talked about in a product-oriented commercial sense, but they can also be talked about as art forms, and the two aren't mutually exclusive. Um, but software really doesn't have an obvious pre-product oriented existence, right? There were never people making software for software's sake before like industry came and commercialized it, right? That relationship has always been really close. Um, and electronics are kind of in the same boat. In fact, a lot of our ecosystems actually discourage uh, experimentation. And one example is Natalie Lawhead who worked on um, Monkey Fortune Tell, she actually was routinely getting her apps and games rejected because they didn't follow the conventions of UI. So for example, like you might hit a minimize button and it maximizes the window. Uh, and that was by design, but um, to them it was seen as broken or, or not user friendly. Um, so in some ways we actually discourage that experimentation with our ecosystems. Um, and I don't know how to fill in the blank for this. Maybe it's like open source kind of, um, but I'm really interested in trying to fill in this blank. Uh, so now I want to talk a little bit about um, this book. This is a cover of a 1999 book called Hertzian Tales, written by critical design researcher Anthony Dunn. And this book was meant to situate electronic objects outside of the marketplace. So he notes that fields like architecture and furniture design have actually been quite good at proposing conceptual, weird, speculative, utopian, bizarro stuff. And a lot of times that those things don't get made, but they get sketched out, they get prototyped. Um, or they, they, someone makes a one-off of a couch that like, has nails instead of a cushion, right? Um, so Dunn is actually saying, like, why aren't we being that conceptual and weird with electronics as well? Um, and I think, you know, this book was written in 99, but it was kind of ahead of its time, I think. 
So well done sites architecture and furniture design, I thought immediately of Paris Fashion Week. So the, these big international fashion shows are design houses opportunities to be incredibly experimental. They wanna push ahead of trends. They wanna imagine what life is gonna be like in 10, 15, 20 years and how we'll dress accordingly for that future. Um, the point isn't to make designs that these fashion houses can sell. Really, like much of this runway stuff never gets produced. Um, it's really about going beyond and trying to imagine and speculate. So what if we treated hacking this way? Uh, actually, Dunn's work actually did get me thinking a lot about hackathons as well. And in particular, um, the series of hackathons called Stupid Hackathons, um, which if you haven't looked into, you should totally check out, I highly recommend. They started in New York City and they've popped up in Toronto and Chicago. Uh, I would really love to host one in Austin. Uh, so these are a few of my uh, favorites. This is uh, one project that was developed during Stupid Hackathon called Outcognito, uh, mode which tweets every website you visit and everything you type. Uh, so anything you put into the browser, um, anything that you're searching for in Google, it actually just tweets it out, uh, which I thought was really awesome. Um, this one is one of my favorites. This is called Magic Nub. It's a Chrome extension that has you navigate web pages with an on-screen, like that red <laughs> keyboard nub, which is so amazing. It's like the opposite of friendly user interface design. Um, I love this, right? I actually like this better than the stuff that I do because it's like more outlandishly useless. Uh, and Anthony Dunn actually kind of talks about this. He, he I mean, not ha stupid hackathons, but he talks about this idea of value fictions, um, which he says, maintain a degree of technological realism while exploring values different uh, from those current. They explore ways of presenting conceptual designs as investigations and processes rather than as finite things in themselves. And finally, they ask questions rather than provide answers and should stimulate discussion in the way a film or novel might. So this is what he's talking about um, back in the 90s about electronic objects, and I think it's so relevant to um, something like the Stupid Hackathon or um, just electronics hacking today. So, you know, the Stupid Hackathon subverts this traditional idea of what a hackathon is and does, especially around these ideas of productivity and innovation. Um, and questioning the standards against, we measure, uh, against which we measure technological progress. So, um, you know, yes, hackathons are disruptive and innovative, but like, is this innovation necessary? Is it a good idea? Um, who does it help? Does it harm people in unintended ways? Does it serve the vulnerable or the powerful? Um, and that's not to say that hackathons are bad, but um, just encouraging a criticality that the marketplace cannot provide. And this is how useless hacks are actually really useful, right? We need to be thinking critically, speculating, asking questions, provoking discussion around the kind of world we want to build together. So I'm proposing a Hertzian toolbox. Um, I know that people need to work and have real jobs and spend their days not making Find My Robot. Um, and I'm very lucky that I have a career that lets me experiment. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about how we can take Dunn's ideas and, and put them toward practical ends. I would encourage you to set aside time for building and sharing useless projects, and that sharing part is really important. Um, it does help you feel energized, build your skills in a low-stress way, um, but it also starts these really important conversations uh, the way that sci-fi and performance art do. Electronic objects that confuse our sensibilities cause us to pause and think and engage uh, critically um, and you know, think about our ideal world. So imagine a better world and then create an electronic object that can only exist once that world does, right? And so this is kind of how I approach my own hacking. So for me, an ideal world is one where every family has a livable income, uh, the promise of automation doesn't create wealth gaps, but it closes them. Um, and, and in that world, what is a computer, right? What does a personal computer do? Um, and so I think about things like, oh, maybe it's all about uh, the environment or nature or something like that, right? So let people see a glimpse of this future um, to help get these conversations started. So for me, using old hardware to create irreverent, cute, whimsical, nonviolent software reflects my ideal world, right? It's one where technologists aren't making obsolete hardware, they're actually reclaiming these things. Um, one in which violence isn't entertaining, it's actually um, you know, the, the uh, number one standard, objective standard by which technology is measured is its cuteness. 
right? And so these, this is like kind of the world that I'm imagining and sort of teasing out with my works. Uh, so I want to end with one more thought on fashion. So uh, you might have heard the phrase haute couture uh, used to describe fancy clothes, but in France it actually has a strict legal definition that's guarded by a, a governing body, so kind of like champagne. To be haute couture, you actually have to meet all these different criteria. Uh, for example, you have to have an atelier in Paris with a certain number of employees. You have to create a certain number of unique fashions every season. So you have a legal obligation to be creative and weird and no legal obligation to be mass marketable. So imagine if there were uh, an equivalent status for hackers, right? Uh, one unique project every season, meaning you can't ever repeat yourself or anything that anyone else has ever done. Uh, you have an obligation to be creative and weird. Uh, and to speculate and predict. So if you want to talk about this with me on Twitter, starting something, I guess uh, Hertzian and Hacks 2018, maybe in Milan, I think would be a good idea. Um, hit me up. I want to get this started. Uh, that's pretty much it for me. You can find uh, me on the web at nobadmemories.com and also my um, archival work at femicom.org. I'm on Twitter all the time. Please find me there. And um, I would encourage you to stick around for Jen Schiffer. And then tomorrow, see my wonderful Microsoft colleagues, Suze Hinton and Andy Raytano. All right, that's it. Thank you very, very much.